midsummer 1915. The war was almost a year old, a visible thing, a landscape halfway to desolation. It stretched from the flats of Flanders, across the wide plains of northern France, to the mountains of the Vosges and the Swiss frontier. Then through Italy and across Serbia, along the edge of the Gallipoli Peninsula. And miles by hundreds of miles through the Russian steppes to the Baltic Sea. A vast circle of flame and hate. Wherever their armies marched, the Germans seemed to be triumphant. Together with the Austrians, they had summoned up pitiless energy to strike down their enemies in the east. The Battle of Golitsi Tarnov had begun in early May. On June the 3rd, the German and Austrian forces recaptured Peshemisu. On the 22nd, they were back in Lemberg, fourth largest city of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and scene of Russia's great victory in 1914. In two months, the combined German and Austrian armies had advanced 150 miles and had inflicted over half a million casualties on the Russians. It was a moment of triumph for the Central Powers. It produced, said Falkenhayn, the German chief of staff, immediate and highly valuable consequences. But enough had not yet been achieved. It was clear that any breaking off of the operations in the East was out of the question. The question was how to exploit the victory. And the answer was not hard to see. For now, the central Russian armies lay within a huge bulge around Warsaw. Falkenhayn planned to encircle them from south and north. Russian soldiers fought with undiminished tenacity, and the bulk of them escaped the German pincers. It took the Germans 17 days to advance 25 miles to Lublin. But on August the 4th, the first anniversary of the war, they entered Warsaw. Russia's agony now began as the invaders swept forward. New hardships fell upon a population to whom hardship itself was nothing new. The self-control with which these poor people met their trouble made one's heart bleed. They had lost everything, but they never complained. The plight of the Russian armies was little better. Their shortage of equipment had now reached the level of catastrophe. The Russian chief of staff told the French ambassador, In several infantry regiments, at least one third of the men had no rifle. These poor devils had to wait patiently under a shower of shrapnel until their comrades fell before their eyes and they could pick up their arms. A Russian commander said, our army is drowning in its own blood. Falkenhayn seized the moment to put out peace feelers to the Tsar. Loyal as ever to his allies, Nicholas II rejected them. But the Tsar's warlike ambitions were drifting ever further apart from the wounds and griefs of his people. French ambassador reported, Disorders in Moscow have been particularly serious. 
The agitation assumed such a scale that it had become necessary to suppress it by force. On the famous Red Square, the mob insulted the royal family, demanded that the Empress should be incarcerated in a convent, and the Emperor deposed. The Tsar took no notice. In September, he assumed personal command of the Russian armies, saying, We shall fulfill our sacred duty to defend our country to the last. We will not dishonor the Russian land. So the war would go on. Now the German armies in the north, under General von Hindenburg, struck eastwards, as they had long been waiting to do, and a melancholy roll call of place names signaled Russia's new disasters. Novogiorgievsk, Bialystok, Kovno, blazing Brestlitovsk, one by one they fell to the advancing Germans. The Kaiser wrote in a letter my victorious sword has crushed the Russians. Woe to them that yet draw the sword against me. The furthest German advance was 300 miles. The Russians lost over 3,000 guns. Their losses in men have been estimated at over 2 million. Even the inexhaustible manpower of the Russian Empire could not stand this rate of loss. Russia faced collapse, and one question echoed again and again in Russian minds. What are our allies doing? The allies were doing their best, and they had received an important reinforcement. On May the 23rd, when the Battle of Gorlitsi Tarnov was three weeks old, Italy declared war on Austria. Italy went to war for territory to expand her frontiers. A secret treaty signed in London promised her the Trentino, the southern Tyrol, Istria, with the port of Trieste. The hope of liberating the large Italian populations under Austrian rule in these areas inspired and excited her. The Italian Prime Minister called this policy Sacro Egoismo, sacred egotism. So war reached out to lay its hand upon fresh landscapes. Silent mountains rumbled with new thunders. The stammer of machine guns was heard among the glaciers. Blood poured out and froze upon the snow. This style of war was something different. In the high Alps, every movement cost a prodigious effort. But this was the war of big guns. The effort had to be made. By marvels of patience, ingenuity and sheer hard work, the Italians prepared their attacks. The advantages were all with their enemies, in prepared positions along the heights. An Austrian officer said, The scenery was really marvelous. Just imagine on top of a 6,000 foot mountain, something which tourists come from far away to see. But from the mil military point of view, the position was marvelous. We saw everything that go went on. We saw every step, every tree uh, in front of us. And if the, we thought if the Italians should attack, it would, they can't get through. It was not against the Alpine barrier to the north that Italy made her effort in 1915. Instead, General Cadorna, the Italian chief of staff, 
threw his forces at the castle, the high plateau blocking the way to Trieste. It has been called an enormous natural fortress, a howling wilderness of stones as sharp as knives. At the foot of the plateau ran the river Isonzo. Four battles of the Isonzo were fought during the year. Four times Cadorna sent his men over the river and up the gaunt, bare hillsides, where every shell burst flung out deadly fragments of stone as well as iron. The Austrians, heavily outnumbered, made full use of their advantages of ground. Two battles fought in June, July and August cost the Italians 60,000 men, and the map showed no change. Two more battles in October, November and December produced small dents in the Austrian line, but Italy lost another 117,000 men. Cadorna had stated his doctrine, The supreme command desires that in all times and in all places an iron discipline should reign throughout the army. The iron discipline of war swiftly seized the Italian soldiers in a merciless grip, and their losses of 180,000 men had hardly advanced the Allied cause at all. In truth, the cause was not advancing. At the far end of the Mediterranean, on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the last British landing, the last big attempt to break through the Dardanelles Straits, came to nothing. The defeat at Suvla Bay in August spelt the defeat of the whole enterprise. As the summer of 1915 wore away, it became clear that nothing that the Allies could do on minor fronts would avail to check Germany's run of victory. The Western Front was never still. Somewhere or other along its 475 miles, in Champagne or Picardy or Flanders, there was always some action, always danger. Between battles, if you were lucky, if you were in a quiet sector, life might not be too bad. Uh, on a nice summer's day, it would. Uh, well, you could think there wasn't a war on, really. Uh, looking through the periscope out to no man's land, you'd see the sandbags of the German front line. You'd see the grass and the flowers out of the front. The birds would start singing if the sun was up on a nice day. Uh, early in the morning, you'd have the first planes coming over and a general air of um, balminess and ease. Uh, breakfast would come up if there was going to be any. Uh, you'd settle down to a, to a day of laziness in the sun if you could. Uh, the lads would sit along the far step and talk and sing. Coming towards the evening, they'd get uh, sentimental, talking about their homes. And then there was old Cornet Joe over in the German front line who used to blow his cornet and play to us the British songs. And uh, he'd play a song and we'd shout over to him, damn good, uh, Jerry, give us another one, Joe. He'd ask us what we wanted and we'd say, well, give us the old bull and bush. He'd play that and we'd sing it. But during, that, uh, during those summer months of 1915, you could forget that there was a war on. You really could. And it did happen sometimes. People would forget and get careless, and before you knew where you were, they were they'd have got a bullet through their head on the latrine or something like that. Snipers. Even during quiet periods, when there was no battle in progress, the British were losing some 300 killed, wounded, and missing every day.
It was a new sort of British army that was coming into existence now on the Western Front, Territorials and the first of Lord Kitchener's new army divisions, beginning to take over from the old sweats. Their good humour and their endless jokes concealing the inner doubts and fears. I think you're chiefly afraid, you, you know, of how you will behave when you really meet the worst things that war can, can produce. And I became afraid of seeing my first dead man. I'd never seen a dead man. Well, now, I knew that there was an old stretch of German trench between our first and second line where there were a lot of German and Canadian corpses. And in order to find myself, I think, I decided one day that I would go and have a look at this and see what I felt about it. And suddenly around a bend in the trench, I came to a great bay that was full of dead Germans. But they weren't a bit horrible. They had been dead for about six weeks, and rubber and rats and maggots and everything else had done their stuff. And they were just shiny skeletons in their uniforms, held together by the dried sinews that was round their bones. It is a most weird and extraordinary picture, and I was absolutely fascinated. A skull, you know, grins at you in a silly way. It laughs at you, and more or less said, Fancy coming here all terrified of dead men. Look how silly we look. The meaning of war unfolded day by day, each day producing new enigmas. One thing was clear to anyone who thought about it. This war was not going in favor of the Allies. The important advantages won by the German armies in 1914 enabled them to call the tune in 1915. Everywhere they stood upon the soil of their enemies. They could afford to sit tight. to wait for the compulsions of war to bring their enemies to them. Once again, Joff planned to hurl his armies at the flanks of the great bulge of the German line in France, attacking from the south in Champagne and from the west in Artois. This time there must be no mistake. But the British army was not yet ready to take part in a great battle. There were not enough guns, there was not enough ammunition. There were very few trained soldiers. Lord Kitchener inspected the eager volunteers of his new army divisions with pride, but also with doubt. He knew, and Sir John French, the commander-in-chief, knew how unready they were. Yet four of these divisions were earmarked for the fight. 
Two Scottish divisions would take part in the attack, two others would be in reserve. These last were completely untried units. They had only had their rifles for two months. They'd only just landed in France. General Haig, who was to command them, said, I question the suitability of new army divisions for this duty on first landing. Lord Kitchener told Haig, He had decided that we must act with all our energy and do our utmost to help the French, even though by doing so we suffered very heavy losses indeed. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. London seemed a long way off now, and even the familiar paintwork of the buses was scarred and dulled by war. Upstairs and down, the rumours passed that a new weapon was to be used in the attack. Gas. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. The place where Joffre wanted the British army to fight was a dismal region. Luz, a shattered mining village. Slag heaps, derelict machinery, ruined cottages, the great twin pylons of what the army called Tower Bridge looming over all. Luz, there was something chilling even about the name. The hour drew near. Much depended on the gas, which would, it was hoped, make up for the shortage of guns and shells. Haig wrote, The greatest battle in the world's history begins today. Some 800,000 French and British troops will actually attack. An anxious night, wondering all the time what the wind would be in the morning. Wondering what the wind would be. The prevailing wind blew towards the Germans. Would it prevail on the day? Captain Gold, the meteorological officer, joined Haig at his observation post that morning. I went up to see Sir Douglas Haig, who came out with a light and saw the charts. Uh, this was about 3 a.m. on the morning of uh, September the 25th. Uh, we looked at the charts and uh, I said the situation had changed as expected, but the wind uh, had fallen lighter than had been expected. Uh, but it was still favourable. And uh, Sir Douglas Haig asked me, well, now, what do you advise? And uh, I naturally demurred and uh, said that uh, I thought that my job was restricted to telling him what the uh, conditions were expected. And he said, well, somebody's got to make the decision. And I said, well, in view of all the conditions, I think uh, it should be as soon as possible. And so he then gave instructions for the attack to be just after 5 a.m. opened up with a terrific bombardment to try and break through the wire and then the gas was let loose and our infantrymen all clad in these Ku Klux Klan helmets just with a little thing to put in the mouth uh, went off with fixed bayonets and they had to charge there was no loitering with those things and uh, what happened was that a lot of them thought that they were suffocating and they pulled the helmets off unfortunately just at that moment, the wind saw fit to change, not only change, but to start to blow back, and the gas came back on our infantry. Where this happened, the attack was checked at once. But elsewhere, Londoners and Scottish troops of the new armies stormed through the village of Luz as far as the German second line.
the chance of a victory seemed good, and Haig was hopeful. The enemy had no troops in his second line, which my plucky fellows reached and entered without opposition. Prisoners state the enemy was so hard put to it for troops that the officers' servants, fatigue men, etc., were pushed forward to hold their second line. If there had been even one division in reserve close up, we could have walked right through. But the reserve divisions of the new army were at least six hours' march away in the rear, struggling towards Luz along congested roads. We hadn't the faintest idea where we were going, no idea at all. And uh, we sang the usual soldier songs, you know, Tipperary and all those sort of things, you know, we were thoroughly enjoying ourselves, you know. And uh, we had the usual halts for, um, supposed to be 10 minutes in every hour. But actually, of course, we halted far more than that because of the chaos on the roads, traffic going up and down, ammunition limbers, ambulances, uh, walking wounded. They said, uh, though we were laughing and talking, eager to, eager to get at him sort of business, uh, they said that you will laugh the other side of your ruddy faces when you get up there. The next morning, these soldiers stumbled into their first battle, tired out, wet through, unfed, bewildered, against an enemy who had had time to draw breath, to bring up supports and throw up new barbed wire defences. The new army men were in dense marching formation. They didn't know they were on a battlefield. They didn't know where the Germans were, or which way to go, or what to do. After a while, the exhausted, stunned regiments wavered, broke, and fled. If you can imagine a, a flock of sheep lying down, sleeping in a field, they were as thick as that. Some of them were still alive, and they were crying out and begging for water, and plucking at our legs as we went by. One hefty chap did grab me round both knees and held me. Water, water, he said. Well, I was just going to take out the, the cork from my water bottle because I had a little left. But I was immediately hustled on by a, a man behind. Get on, get on, he said. We're going to get lost in no man's land. Come on, get on. So it was a case where um, compassion had to give way to discipline. And I had to break away from this man and run to catch up with the, the men in front. 60,000 British troops fell during the three weeks that the battle dragged on. The blame for this failure was laid at the door of Field Marshal Sir John French for keeping the reserve divisions too far back for too long. French was removed from his command and in December his place was taken by General Sir Douglas Haig. This battle marked the end of a phase of Allied hopes. For neither in Artois, beside the British, nor in more distant Champagne, had the French armies found their expected victory. Joffre's attack was the largest single effort of the French army since the opening months of the war. Eighteen divisions were assembled in Artois, 35 in Champagne, more than the whole BEF. The French were supremely confident. Joffre told his men, You will carry all before you. In one bound, you will break through the enemy's defences and reach his artillery. Give him neither rest nor pause until victory is gained. Forward with a good heart to free the soil of our fatherland and in the name of justice and liberty. General de Castelnau prophesied, The guns have done their work so thoroughly that the men can go forward with their rifles at the slope. 
through the drenching autumn rains, across the muddy wastes of no man's land, towards the waiting wire, stormed the French infantry. Once again, the wire and the machine guns were the masters. A French airman observed the fate of the infantry. Our first line of attack was still advancing when the enemy machine guns began to crackle. Their sinister tack, 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 like the sound of a sewing machine, was plowing holes through our advancing battalions. In Champagne, the deepest French advance was less than two miles. In Artois and Champagne together, the French lost nearly 200,000 men. General Joffre drew up a gloomy balance sheet. It can thus be seen that the year 1915 was drawing to a close under conditions that brought small comfort to the Allies. Our armies had everywhere been either checked or beaten and they needed to be reorganized before any new effort could be demanded of them. On the contrary, the enemy appeared to have succeeded in all his undertakings. The fall of the year drew on with yet another triumph for German arms. As Joffre's guns boomed out in Champagne, their preparatory bombardment was echoed in another part of Europe. Germany and Austria together were preparing to fall upon the obstinate Serbs with crushing might. The Serbs knew what was coming and begged for Allied help. But how could they help this landlocked, isolated country in the heart of the Balkan Mountains? Only with the aid of Serbia's ally, Greece. The Greek Premier, Venizelos, was agreeable. He mobilized the army and appealed for 150,000 British and French troops. The place selected for their landings was Salonika. Salonika, a seedy cosmopolitan port at the head of the Aegean Sea, was chosen by the Allies because of its good harbor, because it was only 50 miles from the Serbian frontier, and because of its railway lines leading up country. The first French division landed on October the 5th. But on that very day, Venizelos was dismissed by King Constantine, who declared that Greece would stay neutral. She would not honor her alliance with the Serbs. A British division, rushed from Gallipoli, followed the French. As the Allies came ashore, they looked around them with mixed and curious feelings. Their position was unenviable. It was reported... The German spies sit in rows on the quays at Salonika, smoking large cigars, and note down every man, horse, gun, and ton of stores landed. This is a nice way to make war. A naval officer met some disembarking British troops with the cheerful greeting, Well, your war's over. In two days you'll have been disarmed and interned by the Greeks. It was not quite so bad as that, but it was an uneasy situation which made effective help for Serbia well-nigh impossible. And the Serbs were in sore need of help. On October the 6th, the Austro-German offensive began across the Danube and the Sava. October the 9th, they entered Belgrade, this time for good. Two days later, without any declaration of war, the Bulgarians struck in at the flank of the Serbian armies from the east. Bulgaria was drawn into the war by greed for Serbian territory and by hatred born in the Balkan Wars. All the savagery of those bitter conflicts was revived as her army advanced. No quarter was asked and none was given to soldier or peasant alike in this savage conflict, fraught with tribal hate. The Serbs had no chance. 
Down towards the frontier of Albania, the remnants of a proud army trudged out of the dust and mud of the central plain into the barren, rocky hills. An English naval officer from Belgrade watched their retreat. Here was no orderly march of troops. They crawled at snail's pace, staggering, bent to the ground, supporting themselves on sticks. Many were without cap or boots, and their clothes hung on them in rags. Some who were too weak to walk alone were helped along by friends. Many were dying of sheer hunger, exposure, fatigue, and the last stages of dysentery. Here and there was a huddled heap upon the ground, the body of some lad too weak to walk further who'd turned aside to die. The haunting thing was that their faces were all exactly alike. Starvation had reduced them all to the same mask of pain. The Serbian retreat was more than the retreat of an army, it was the flight of a people. Through the inhospitable mountains, the Serbian cavalry dragged on. Oh, pray that your flight be not in winter. Seldom had Christ's words seemed more appropriate. O oh, people who bow down to see the miracle of Calvary, the bitter and the glorious, bow down, bow down and pray for us. Sue for them and all of us who the world over suffer thus, who have scarce time for prayer indeed, who only march and die and bleed. By the end of 1915, one-sixth of Serbia's entire population would be dead. 100,000 men out of 400,000 were all that remained of her army to reach the sea and safety. And all that their allies could do for them was to take them off and give them a haven on the Isle of Corfu. The fall of Serbia symbolized the wreck of a year in which much hope had died. It was clear to the Allies that the war would never be won this way. On December the 6th, General Joff convened an Allied conference at Chantilly. It was agreed that a decisive result should be sought through coordinated offensives on three fronts, Russian, Franco-British and Italian. These offensives were to be launched simultaneously to prevent the enemy from moving his reserves from one front to another. This conference marks a vital date in the history of the conduct of the war. So a bleak year ended with hope revived. 